can help this agency accept the recommendations of my favorite report. I'm all for it, and I will follow it with a Greek dance. <laughs> Not now. Uh, the title of this uh, speech, over the years, I have seen studies that take past incidents, past accidents at nuclear reactors, and through some statistical analysis, they produce uh, maybe the frequency of core damage or uh, the frequency of releases, but it's really the core damage events that are usually of interest. So I decided with some of my friends, the staff, whom I will name later, uh, to take a, a look and see what is the issue there. What, what do we learn from these analyses and what is the state of, uh, of knowledge regarding uh, the frequency of core damage. Now, before I continue, well, this is it, I suppose. Yeah. I think I need to explain what I mean by global statistical analysis. Uh, we, were, we struggled with find, trying to find a better terminology. By that I mean the estimation of uh, core damage frequency or, or large early release frequency using accidents that happened at a high level, at a plant level, like core damage events. Uh, PRA also uses statistics, but at a much lower level, at the component level. So that's the big difference, that in a PRA we use analysis, we identify uh, accident sequences and so on, and then we use statistical information at a low level of components and human performance sometimes, uh, whereas in the global analysis, it's at a very, very high level. So many core damage events worldwide divide by the number of years, and you get the estimate. I think I, it's important to understand how decisions are made, and I believe the chairman alluded to this earlier today, talking about the kinds of knowledge that we have to have when we make decisions. Regulatory decision-making is based on what we know when we make the decision, on the current state of knowledge. It does not involve any prophesies, what prophecies as to what's going to happen in the future. It is what we know now. And what is it that shapes this current state of knowledge? It's the design of the facilities. It's the operation and uh, the regulations. And we're informing this state of knowledge by science, and the chairman talked about the earth sciences earlier this morning, engineering, the design and operation of the facilities, and operating experience, especially including past incidents. So it's important to bear in mind that probabilistic risk assessment does not predict anything. We are not trying to predict the future. We are evaluating possible evolutions of accidents based on what we know now. We don't claim we are trying to predict what's going to happen and enumerate future possibilities so that the decision makers will have a better picture of what may happen and uh, make better decisions. So this is very important to bear in mind. Nobody is trying to predict what will happen in the future. And sometimes you hear, you know, did you predict Three Mile Island and so on? Well. There are thousands, tens of thousands of sequences that are in a PRA. One of them may predict 
what happened, there will be thousands of others that didn't. So these are evaluations or assessments of possible evolutions of accidents. Now, probability is not always an easy concept to, to use, and uh, there is a nice story here. If you live to be a hundred, rejoice. Why? Because very few people die past that age. <laughs> Fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of conditional probability in the first statement and unconditional probability in the second. Now, that's not my joke. It was told by a well-known American comedian, George Burns. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about how these global estimates, remember, at the plant level are produced. Am I there? Yeah. In order to be able to say something about the frequency of core damage of current reactors, and you want to use statistical analysis, you have to make sure that your statistical sample consists of reactors, plants, that are what are, is called in probability theory exchangeable events. In other words, is a current reactor of the same design, of the same uh, operation procedures, and under the same regulatory requirements as a reactor back in the 70s, back in the 80s? Is it the same as a, under the same, con operating under the same conditions as the Daiichi plants in Japan were operating? This is a fundamental assumption that we cannot ignore when we sample, when we create a statistical sample. So this exchangeability you will hear about throughout this speech. So when people use this formula, dividing the number of incidents by the number of years, there is this assumption behind it that the incidents at reactors, that the incidents you're including in your sample happen at reactors that are, let's call them, nominally identical with current reactors, at least in this country. And it turns out that this is not quite true, as we will see in, the few, uh, in a, a few minutes. Now, the, the reason I think it's important to bear in mind this principle of exchangeability or assumption of exchangeability, and I think there is another example that really brings the message home. Okay. Uh, Professor Wilson of Harvard published a book a number of years back where he listed the riskiest professions in the United States. And uh, he stated that the riskiest professor, uh, profession is being president that the probability of death of a president is 0 0.019 per year, followed by firefighters, a factor of 48 lower, and police officers, a factor of 59 lower. Now, he didn't comment on it, but I thought that was strange. So. I tried to find out how that number was der derived. Well, as most people in this audience know, there have been four assassinations going back to 1865. So the number of years of the Republic until the time that this calculation was done was 211. So if I use the formula I showed you a minute ago, divide 4 by 211, you get 0 0.019. <clears throat> so the question is then, 
is this really? Yeah. <laughs> is 0 0.019 the risk of a modern president? I don't believe that. I don't believe that it's riskier than being a fire firefighter or a policeman. So if you think about it now, the answer is no, because what happened in 1865, 1881, and so on, the, presidency, the presidencies at that time are not exchangeable with the modern presidency. The protections are higher. You might argue that the ways of attacking the president are also more sophisticated these days, but the point is that the whole structure of the presidency and the protections that various federal agencies provide are very different from those of 1865. So this number is not valid. It was derived under the false assumption of exchangeability. Now, uh, even if we accept that Three Mile Island is not exchangeable with modern reactors, it would be nice to know how to do the analysis right. So if you take as statistical evidence one core damage event back in Three Mile Island, uh, over 38, or approximately 3,800 reactor years of experience, and you use <coughs> what is known as Bayes' theorem, you get this uncertainty distribution, which ranges from something like 8, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus is important, <laughs> 4, all the way down to 10 to the minus 6. Now, this is the uncertainty that you would have derived if you had made the false assumption that Three Mile Island is exchangeable with modern reactors. Uh, so you might ask, why do I say that? Well, look at the changes that have been, and have been implemented and continue to be implemented after Three Mile Island. There was a, a large number, according to some people, a very large number, of regulatory changes uh, after Three Mile Island. And right now, as it was pointed out by earlier speakers, uh, there are major changes in our re regulatory structure because of Fukushima. Uh, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations was established after Three Mile Island that has had an impact on the way the facilities are operated. Uh, the NRC established the individual plant uh, examination uh, program and the individual plant examination for external events program where the licensees identified uh, vulnerabilities and they took action to fix them. And a major step forward is also the FLEX program that the industry is proposing and implementing right now after Fukushima. So these are a few of the changes that really invalidate the assumption of exchangeability. Um, now, what, does, what are the numbers that reasonably recent PRAs are telling us about core damage? Uh, the, I'm, we have plotted here the point estimates that have been reported. These are not uncertainty estimates, unlike what I showed earlier. The curve earlier was the uncertainty distribution. This is just the point estimates of reactors as they have been reported. And they range from 10 to the minus 4 again all the way down to 10 to the minus 7, uh, 6. The analysis is based on uh, submissions by uh, 61 units and 90% uh, of these submissions of, uh, occurred after 2005, so they're fairly recent results. If, mo if we move on to the large early release frequency, the statistical analysis is even more problematic. The reason being that there have been zero 
large leases in the United States. And again, if you take zero with 3,800 reactor years, if you divide, of course, you, you get zero, but if you go to Bayes theorem, you get a distribution that you see here, and the numbers range from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus nine, a tremendous range of uncertainty. And all this says is that this range is consistent with seeing zero events in 3,800 years. Now, the, uh, the distribution of the LERF estimates from PRAs, again, it's, this is based on 55 units, 90% after 2005. It's a, much, it's a smaller range, 10 to the minus 5, all the way down to 10 to the minus 6. And again, the statistical analysis is not widely inconsistent with the PRA estimates, although, again, the statistical analysis is questionable. So, to reinforce, well, first of all, I, I have already said that exchangeability doesn't apply, but the question then is, so all these accidents in the past are useless? Of course not. Of course not. We are learning a lot from each accident or incident, and again, this morning, previous speakers talked about uh, the changes that were implemented after uh, Fukushima. So, it, this is a continuous learning process. In other words, the value of the experience with the accidents is the qualitative insights. What happened? Trying to understand why it happened. What can we do so that it will not happen again? So, here is a list of uh, uh, lessons learned and uh, actions taken after Three Mile Island. Uh, auxiliary feed, uh, a lot of auxiliary feed, uh, feed water systems at the time before the accident were only manually actuated. After the accident, all of them converted to automatic actuation. And uh, there is a number of things here. The emergency planning regulations were upgraded. Uh, there were requirements related to hydrogen control. Uh, operator training was improved. Uh, staffing requirements and the program on fitness of, for duty was established. Uh, if you look at uh, Fukushima, we, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, the Commission has issued uh, three orders that are being implemented right now. So uh, uh, we required uh, mitigation strategies for uh, beyond design basis accidents. Uh, we are studying very vigorously the issue of uh, uh, multi-unit accidents, although in the United States there are only a few sites that have three units. Uh, it was mentioned earlier also about the severe accident capable and uh, containment vents for BWRs with Mark I and II containments. And uh, well, it's clear what we've done. Uh, but it's important also to bear in mind that we are not learning only from experience, from our operating experience. Analysis is contributing a lot to our state of knowledge. Uh, going back to the mid-70s, the first probabilistic risk assessment, the reactor safety study, pointed out the importance of the small loss of coolant accident, because at that time everybody was focusing on the large loss of coolant accident, the significance of human errors and support systems. Uh, that study was followed by two industry-sponsored PRAs in the early 80s, those for Zion and Indian Point, which for the first time identified the significance of fires and earthquakes to nuclear power plant risk. People were aware of the seismic risk and uh, fires and so on. There was a fire protection program before that. But really, the focus was on the large break 
of a pipe. And it was for the very first time, interestingly enough, by a study sponsored by the industry, that these two major contributors to risk were identified, and this finding has been confirmed time and time again in the last 30 years. In the 80s, we received word from France that our colleagues there had done a PRA for uh, low power and shutdown modes, and they found that the risk from those modes was comparable to the, to the risk from power operations. That was a surprise to people, at least in this country, and because being shut down was considered a safe mode, and uh, that changed the way we looked at low power and shutdown. That did not come about because of operating experience. Somebody sat down and did a PRA and identified it. And the last point I want to make here is that uh, another finding of the numerous PRAs that have been done over the years for plants uh, demonstrate that the risk is plant-specific. And a good example is, again, going back to the Indian Point studies of 30 years ago, where Indian Point 2 and 3 are called sister units, yet the dominant contributors are different. At that time, the dominant contributor to latent uh, health effects was fire in one of the units. And the other one was earthquakes. So what is the message here? Which way? Global statistical analysis requires the assumption that, at least if you want to do it for the United States, that Three Mile Island 2 is exchangeable with current reactors. It is not. It is the qualitative insights from operational experience that are most useful, of course, in regulatory decision making, but also for the industry. It's not the frequency of core damage and release that is derived from that experience. And the PRA results represent the current design, operation, and regulation. So, regulatory decision-making, as I said earlier, must be based on the best current state of knowledge. Uh, and that state of knowledge uh, includes, uh, is, refers to the design, operation, and regulation uh, of the facilities. Uh, it is informed by science, engineering, and operating experience, including those past accidents. And uh, unfortunately, the need for the assumption of exchangeability between past, present, past and present reactors or future reactors invalidates the global statistical estimates. And another message that I would like you to live with is that PRAs do not predict anything. They evaluate and assess potential accident scenarios so that better decisions will be made. So Mark Twain said something that is consistent with what I just told you. Facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable.